We are joined live in London in the UK by Dr. Diva Aman. So she is a Trinidadian deep sea biologist who studies what lives in our world's deep oceans and how the actions that we do affect those creatures and habitats. She's gone down in submersible. She's been featured on pretty much every media outlet you can possibly imagine with a fantastic outreach. She is currently at the London Natural History Museum, one of the most elite research facilities in the entire world, and she's the co-founder of the, or the founder of the NGO nonprofit Species Dedicated to Marine Conservation, Science, and Advocacy in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean in general. We are so thrilled to have her back, and so without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Amon, and take it away. Brilliant. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good night, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me and for tuning into this. It's going to be great. Uh, so before I begin, I want to see how many of you know a bit about the deep sea, because this isn't something that, you know, many people talk about that we really get to engage with in, a, in an interesting way. Sometimes like how many of us have been to the deep sea? Very few. So Jess, you're going to have to help me with this, but I want to ask you guys to tell me four things about the deep sea that All you right. know about. If you were to go down there right now, what would it be like down there? Four things. Four things. So let's go to Mr. Sinclair's class to kick us off. What do you guys think of when you think of the deep sea? You can just yell it out. <laughs> Very dark. Exactly. Okay, great. That's one. So it's extremely dark. Once you go down about 400 meters into the sea, there is no sunlight, none whatsoever. Right. What are the next three? One. Mr. Rootson's class, what do you guys think? Possibly go ahead. Um, that there's fish. Fish? <laughs> there are lots of fish. There are not just lots of fish, but there are lots of animals, as I'm going to tell you about in my presentation. That was not one of the things I was looking for, but hey, that's an extra bonus one. So three more I'm looking for. All right, how about Mr. Mayo's class? What do you guys think? Any, yeah? What was that? You need oxygen. Oxygen, okay. Do you need oxygen? So let me ask, do you think it's really cold down there or do you think it's really hot down there? Really cold. Really cold. Really cold, exactly. So temperatures in the deep sea, tend to be just about freezing, just above, only a little bit warmer than freezing. So two more I'm looking for. Okay, Miss Aitchison's class, what do you guys think? Let's get your mic. Oh, taking a second. So yeah, come on up, demute your mic, and we'll ask away. Okay, go next. Um, that uh, the, ocean, the lowest point in the ocean floor that has been discovered now is the Mariana Trench, which is like, 10,000 feet down or something? I mean, yes, exactly. So it, the deepest point in our oceans is in the Pacific at a place in the Mariana Trench called Challenger Deep. And it is over 10,000 meters, right? So that's like three times 10,000 feet. That's a really, really, really long way. But let me ask you guys, do you think it's there are really high pressures down there or do you think it's really low pressures down there? High. high pressures exactly so when you go down into the deep sea because there's so much water there it causes there to be lots and lots of pressure and so as a result like for instance if you for every like 30 feet you go down in the sea you gain the equivalent pressure to what we're feeling now so something called an atmosphere of pressure so if you go down to like 300 times what we're feeling now what, sorry, 300 times, three, let me start again, three <laughs> kilometers depth, I just get some tired sometimes, three kilometers depth, it would be equivalent to 300 times the pressure we're feeling now. So that's a lot, right? And so finally, the last class, let me, Jesse, you can choose. Do we think there's a lot of food in the deep sea or a little bit of food in the deep sea? All right, that's Mr. the question I want to throw to Mr. Peters' class, what do you think, a lot or a little? A little bit of food, what do you think? A little bit. A little bit. A little bit of food, exactly. So down in the deep sea, most of the food comes actually from the sea surface. So, you know, we all know that there's so much sunlight at the sea surface, and that's where all the plankton are and all the fish are, and most of the life in the ocean is concentrated up there. But when they die, like whales, turtles, fish, um, plankton, they all 
or a lot of them drift down into the deep sea. And that's actually where most of the food comes from in the deep ocean. And so because of that, there really isn't that much there. So to wrap up, basically we've got, it's cold, it's dark, really high pressures and not a lot of food. So really it's not a very easy place to live. So I want you guys to remember that. So let's start the presentation. Okay, let me see if I can get this to work. While you're getting that up too, I want to say that one of the YouTube classes wrote dark, cold, two worms, vents, and mid-ocean ridge, which I love as a group of answers. <laughs> I mean, those are <laughs> great answers. Wait, okay, so what are you seeing now? Right now, you actually had it before. So right now you get your whole okay, slide. Wait. Oh, you're entirely back to you. Sorry. That's okay. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. Right. Okay. Oh God. <laughs> this is like confounding. Bear with me. We can solve problems in the deep sea, but can we figure out Zoom together? Right? I know, right? B just basic computer issues. Okay. What about now? Uh, now you're good. Go for it. Yay. Okay. Great. So, um, as Jesse said, I'm a deep sea biologist. I grew up in the Caribbean, um, but I'm currently based in London at the Natural History Museum there. And really, you know, the Caribbean is, is not like I'm sure where you guys live. It's pretty hot most of the time. There are lots of beaches. And I grew up surrounded by water, by the sea. And so that meant that, you know, becoming a marine biologist was kind of an easy decision. Um, so, but as I got older, I kind of realized that there were so many questions that I couldn't answer about the ocean, especially the deep ocean. And so I decided that, hey, I, that would be perhaps a really cool place to study. And I'll tell you a lot of reasons for why that is now. So, my research concentrates, as Jesse said, on trying to, oh, wait, bear with me. Oh no. How do I get the sound off of a video? We can't hear the sound anyway. Oh, okay. Did you not just hear that sound? We should, no. Okay, fab, yeah. that's great. That's exactly what I wanted. Uh, it's like the tech is just not, just not me today. Okay. So, as Jesse said, my research concentrates on trying to answer two questions. First, for a lot of the deep sea, because we've never explored it, we actually don't even know what lives there, okay? And then the second thing is, because we don't know what lives there, we humans are impacting it already. Like, for instance, how we're impacting the land and in shallow waters, that is the same for the deep sea. And so my work is trying to understand how we're impacting the deep sea, and then trying to come up with ways that we can potentially fix it. So I study the big sort of fun animals that you don't need a microscope to look at, things you can see in pictures and videos. And I really, really feel very lucky to do what I do. There are very few careers that allow you to be amongst the first people on the planet to see something. And as a result, you know, it just is a very humbling feeling when you, when you make discoveries, which happens almost every single time we venture down into the deep sea. And so the reason I wanted to show you guys this quick video was that to explain that to do my research, I get to go actually down into the deep sea sometimes using what you can see here. This is called a submersible. And it's a type of sort of submarine. And it's basically our sort of car down into the deep ocean. And so for between one and three months of the year, I spend time on ships like that, that you just saw out in the middle of the ocean, studying parts of the ocean that people have never explored before. And it's really, really exciting. We get to use cool tools, we get to see cool things, and we get to answer questions that nobody has answered before. So when I talk about the deep sea, what exactly do I mean? Well, most of the deep sea is everything that is deeper than 200 meters. So that's about 600 feet depth. And that's everything in, that is dark blue on this map. So you can see that is a huge amount of our world, right? In fact, the deep sea occupies over 60% of the Earth's surface, 
and provides over 96% of all the space for animals and plants and other forms of life to live in on our planet. And that makes it really our largest ecosystem by far. But for most of the deep sea, as I said already, it's really, really unexplored. Actually over 99% of it has never been seen by the human eye or using a camera. And so that means that for most of our planet, we just don't know what's there. We have better maps of the moon, of Mars and of Venus than we do our own seafloor. And that's just a pretty crazy fact, isn't it? So most of the deep sea was thought to look a lot like this picture. So this is, this was taken um, at about 4,000 meters, so four kilometers down in the deep sea. And this is in the North Atlantic, right? And this is basically, a, looks pretty boring. There's not a lot of life. Yes, there's this little sea urchin you can see in the front, but really there's not much else. There's a lot of sediment and it just doesn't look like such a fun place. But actually that's because it's a hard place to live. As you heard, low temperatures, high pressures, not a lot of food and also no light. And so it means that life is really difficult, but life always finds a way, right? So even though some of the deep sea looks like this, a lot of it looks like this. So we see lots of different habitats. So just like on land, how you have savannas and rainforests and deserts, just like that, we have different habitats down in the deep sea. So there are things like coral gardens, which we often call rainforests of the deep down in the deep sea on mountains under the sea that we call sea mounts. And so these are some pictures taken close to the Mariana Trench um, in 2016 on an expedition that I led. And you can see it's just really beautiful colors, really, really stunning habitat. And not only do we have coral gardens, but also, oh, turn this volume down. Also, there, there are things like hydrothermal vents. So those are really, really fantastic places in the sea, on, in the deep sea, they're found only in the deep sea, where super hot, chemical rich fluid gushes from the seafloor. And that's what you can see here and looks almost like smoke, but it's not smoke. It's just super hot water that's full of metals. And when it comes out of the seafloor, it forms these chimney-like structures. And those fluids actually power the ecosystems and lots and lots of animals come to live in these really extraordinary habitats. In fact, some of these animals you can, that you're like the ones you're seeing here in this video actually use, instead of using uh, light like plants do to create food, instead this entire ecosystem runs on chemical energy rather than light energy. And it's something called chemosynthesis. And that's actually what powers many of these ecosystems and gives many of these animals food. And then we have other deep sea habitats like food falls. So that's like what we were talking about at the beginning when a lot of the food comes from the sea surface. And yes, you get little bits of plankton that rain down and there's something we call marine snow because it looks like snow in the ocean. But then you also get much bigger packages of food. So things like whales and trees uh, manta rays, turtles. So when they die and sink down into the deep sea, they actually become sort of these feasts. It's like Thanksgiving, right? Like your family from around the country all flock to this massive whale carcass to basically eat all of the flesh because really these kinds of feeding opportunities are very, very rare. And many of the animals want to make the most of it. And so you can see this picture in the top right was a fresh whale body that came down to the seafloor off California and is being eaten by those eel-like things are called hagfish. They're a special deep sea fish that are able to tie themselves into knots and create their own slime. I mean, it's like something from a horror movie. And then the picture in the bottom right is the same whale 
that was taken several months later. And you can see that all of the flesh is gone. And now that's, we're looking at the whale vertebral column. So the spine of the whale there, as well as some ribs. And really every bit of the whale over time will be used, not just the flesh, but also the bones will be eaten. And then also it can form a habitat, like animals will come and live on the bones and shelter in the bones. Really animals come from far and wide to use it for quite a long time. And the same can be said for trees, which you can see an example of in the bottom left. And there aren't just, you know, hydrothermal vents and food falls and coral gardens on seamounts. There are also lots of other habitats like canyons, trenches, lakes at the bottom of the ocean called brine pools, cold seeps. I mean, really, there is just a huge range of habitats down there. So how do we study what we do down in the deep sea? Well, you saw that little video already, and that sort of tells you about the submersibles, which we'll talk a little bit about again in a second. But sometimes we don't go down ourselves into the deep sea because actually it's very time consuming. And while it's not dangerous, it's just not as efficient. And so oftentimes we use these. They're called remotely operated vehicles or ROVs. And they're basically robots that we send down into the deep sea. This one is about the size of a car and they are able to go down to the deep sea. We control them from the ship. They have arms you can see two arms on the front of that one as well as lots of cameras and sensors and they also have two baskets you can see on the front that we're able to put samples in so the arms can pick up samples whether it is a biology sample like an animal or a rock put them into the baskets we close the baskets and then we can use it to tell things like temperature salinity um, oxygen content and so on as well as get really great imagery and so really, these are sort of our workhorses. We use them all the time in deep sea science. But then also we use the much more exciting submersibles and ships. And so this was the ship that you saw in the video, the Aleutia. And this is one of the submersibles that they have on board. And so really, while submersible use is a lot rarer now, it is still a really, really exciting tool to use because it gives us researchers the chance to actually go down there and see everything with our own eyes, which is an absolutely incredible experience. But, you know, these ships are like working sort of, um, it's like a building at sea, right? There will be, because we go out to sea for, a month at a time usually it means we need to take everything like you can't just pop to the grocery so we take lots and lots of food all the equipment we might need um, things to keep us occupied in case there's a storm and we're not allowed to do work we'll take movies and music and lots of other things but these ships can hold about 50 to 60 people they'll have a gym they'll have people who cook all the food people who drive the ships engineers who keep the ship working, people who drive the submersibles, there'll be scientists, there'll be sometimes photographers or videographers. Really, there's a huge mix of people that can be out at sea working on these vessels. So why is the deep sea important? Why should we really care about it? I mean, many of us will never go there and it's kind of far away, right? Well, as you heard, it's the largest ecosystem on the planet. And so it plays a really big role in keeping our planet essentially healthy and keeping us alive. How does it do that? Well, it does things like cycle nutrients in our oceans so that they keep functioning the way they should. It removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as well as heat. And that's crucially important to keeping the temperature of our planet where it is right now. And especially important given the huge changes in temperature and you know, the onset of climate change that we're seeing as well. The deep sea also plays a role in detoxifying our oceans. So a lot of the bad stuff from the shallows will end up down in the deep sometimes and be locked away. And then more and more, because on sh in shallow waters and in the deep ocean and on land, sorry, we are running out of resources we might need we are now looking to the deep sea for them. So things like fishing. Fishing has happened in the deep sea for decades and it's a place that we get food from. You, I mean, I'm sure many of you in the room probably have eaten deep sea fish and, and haven't actually realized. 
Then there's things like oil and gas. We use it to power our economies and a lot of it comes from the deep sea. Then now there's the potentially the, the onset of deep sea mining, a place that we potentially might get minerals or metals from in the future. And then medicine, you know, one of the best treatments against breast cancer is from a marine sponge, a sponge found in the ocean. And so with that in mind, you know, now we're looking to the deep sea to think, hey, what useful medicine and antibiotics and other types of treatments might there be that can help us in the future? Really, the deep sea could potentially provide us with a lot of really useful things that could help to solve a lot of challenges that humanity will face in the future. And then of course, like working in the deep sea means that new technology is being developed all the time. For instance, there are some sponges that are made of glass. Yes, glass sponges. I encourage you to Google that after. That actually have provided inspiration for more efficient internet cables. Okay, so those are some of the, the, the um, inventions and discoveries that are coming about because of deep sea research. And ultimately, I want you, if you remember one thing from this presentation, from this, from this event, is that our planet cannot be healthy unless we have a healthy ocean and a healthy deep ocean. So I wanted to sort of focus, as you heard, because there are so many habitats in the deep sea, it means there's lots and lots and lots of different animals. Like it's thought that there are a million species in our oceans and over two thirds of those we haven't even discovered yet. That's crazy, right? Think about how much there is left to, to discover in the oceans. So I thought I'd wrap up by telling you about my four favorite deep sea animals that I've seen during my exploration. And these are just, you know, some of the crazy deep sea animals out there. And actually, while we're talking about glass sponges, this animal in the center of the screen is one of those glass sponges. Right, so my four favorite deep sea animals. Let's go. So we have first up the giant isopod. These are one of my favorites. They're a little bit scary looking, a little bit creepy, but I think they're really cute. And remind me to show you my stuffed toy at the end. So these are kind of like roly polies. If you go into the forest and look in a, in a dead log, I'm sure you'll find something called a roly poly. And this is the marine deep sea version. But what is cool about these is that they are giant. Like I'm talking over a foot long, okay? And they are one of the most important scavengers in the deep sea. They will eat basically anything we think that lands up in the deep sea dead. And they play a really, really important role. And just, they look adorable when they swim. I think they're super cool. So that's number four. Number three. Oh no, the sound is on again. Let's put this down. Right, number three. Um, this is, Casper the octopus. It's been nicknamed Casper because it's obviously white and pretty friendly looking like Casper the ghost. But this was discovered off Hawaii um, a couple of years ago and it was found at a depth of nearly three miles. Okay, so this is deep. And this is a new species and it still doesn't have a name, even though it was discovered a few years ago because we didn't collect. And so one of the rules of science is that you have to collect some collect something to be able to properly analyze it, to call it a new species and give it a name. Let's play that again while I'm talking. So this one still doesn't even have a name yet, right? So if any of you feel like being deep sea biologists and describing octopus, giving it names, it's a pretty good career choice. But what is special about this octopus is that it's really the deepest of this type of octopus. So most octopus in the deep sea are nicknamed Dumbo octopus. And that's because they have these really big flaps on the side of their head that are like, they are fins and they use them to swim. So they look like Dumbo the elephant. But this one you can see doesn't have those flaps. And so there's something called insert octopus. Um, and so usually they're found much, much shallower, but this is not just a new species, not just a new genus, which is an even bigger category of new species, but it's also the deepest octopus ever found without the fins. So pretty extraordinary discovery. Then we have my second favorite, 
is the Yeti crab. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. Um, this is a blind white crab. They are found at hydrothermal vents like those you saw videos of earlier. And they're found at hydrothermal vents only close to Antarctica that we know of, right? So in the Southern Ocean and uh, perhaps a little in the Indian Ocean as well. And these are really special. You can see they're found at these hydrothermal vents in the you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands, like this picture you're seeing here, they're just piled on top of each other, trying to get close to that warm chemical rich fluid from the hydrothermal vent. But they're really cool and they're called Yeti crabs because they are furry or hairy. So you can see the picture at the top on the underside of the Yeti crab under on its chest and on the undersides of its arm, there are lots and lots of hairs. And so it uses these hairs to grow bacteria like a farm, right? It has arm farms and it farms the bacteria on its arms and its chest, and then it eats the bacteria. So it scoops it off and puts it into its mouth. And that is how this Yeti crab lives. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I eat a lot of food and I would happily have a farm on my body that I could eat from. It just makes life so much simpler. So my favorite deep sea animal is the long-nosed chimera. I just love these. They are the cutest. They're off, off also called ratfish or rabbitfish or swoopfish. And they are a type of, um, well, they're related rather to sharks and rays. Um, and this one was photographed and we saw a lot of them in the Gulf of Mexico last year. So close to some of you guys. And really they're just adorable. They use that big long nose as sort of a, um, what's the right word? As sort of a sensor to pick up animals that they could eat, prey that they could eat in the seafloor using electrical charges. And you can see they also have a spike on the top of their fin. So on their dorsal fin, you can see there's a spike there and those are known to be venomous. And generally they're just amazing. Look at his little eyes and or big eyes. They're pretty big eyes um, and long nose. They're just the best. Anyway, so I hope I've convinced you that the deep sea isn't scary and is actually pretty cool and home to lots of really cool animals. And most importantly, it is important. The deep ocean is important to keeping our planet healthy and keeping us alive. So thank you for having me and thank you to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants.